All right, Mr. Huge, I need a little energy from you today, a little enthusiasm. I feel like we're a little bit down, so I want you to practice a little bit. Give me the hardiest amen that you can. Amen. Amen. Let's do it again. Give me another uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, with enthusiasm, turn your Bible to Romans chapter 1. Give it a little bit of energy. It's exciting to be in God's house. Amen. Amen. We don't want to just go through the motions. We don't want faces so long like a donkey sucking uh, sucking uh, something through a straw. Amen. We want to we have some excitement in God's house. Romans chapter 1 today is where we're at as we're studying this amazing book in our sermon series simply called Walking the Romans Road. So I hope you have a good pair of knockies on. I wore my basketball shoes today because we are walking the Romans Road together. Amen. And we are in Romans chapter 1. A sermon today simply called A Gospel to be Proud of. It's something that we can have proud response, not to ourselves, but to the gospel of God. What He has done and what He is doing should drive us to a place of excitement and enthusiasm and a great amount of gratitude. Amen? Amen. Amen. So there was a Minnesota couple who decided to go to Florida to thaw out during the particularly icy winter. They planned to stay in the very same hotel that they spent their honeymoon in 20 years earlier. Because of their hectic schedules, it was difficult for the couple to coordinate their travel plans. So the husband left Minnesota and flew to Florida on Thursday. His wife planned to fly down the following day. The husband checked into the hotel, and once he got there, he decided to write his wife an email. So he opened up his laptop, and he decided to send the message to his bride. However, he accidentally left out one letter of her email address and sent the email uh, with the wrong address on accident. Meanwhile, somewhere in Houston, a widow had just returned home from her husband's funeral. He was a Baptist minister who'd been called to glory following a recent heart attack. The widow decided to check her emails, expecting condolence messages from family and friends. But after reading her very first email, she screamed and she fainted. The widow's son rushed into the room and found his mother on the floor. And he looked on the screen of the computer and he saw these words. To my loving wife, I just arrived today. I know you're surprised to hear from me, but I decided to write you a message from Florida since I just arrived and I wanted to let you know that there I'm waiting for you and I will see you tomorrow. Oh, no. Everything has been prepared for your arrival. Looking forward to see you. I hope that your journey is as uneventful as mine. P.S. It sure is hot down here. Oh! All right. So Paul didn't send an email. He didn't have access to a, a, a computer or a smartphone, but he sent a letter to Rome, not to talk about the heat of hell, but to talk about the glory of the gospel. And we're going to talk about that today and for a number of weeks to follow, the gospel of God to which we must not be ashamed. Paul says, I am rock rib conviction upon this truth of the gospel. It is who I am today, and I want you, church in Rome, to know that gospel message. And friends, that's my desire for this church as well, is for us to know the gospel, to embrace the gospel, to share the gospel, and to rejoice in the gospel of God. I want that truth to penetrate your heart, my heart, our heart corporately as never before in a special way as we study this book called Romans. Follow as I read, beginning in verse 1. We'll read through verse 17, but we're going to focus today on primarily on verses 14 through 17. Paul, a bondservant, a willing servant 
under the authority and the rule of Jesus Christ called by God to be an apostle or a sent one, separated to the gospel of God, not the gospel of man, not the gospel of Paul, not the gospel of the Pharisees, but the gospel of God, which He promised before through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures. All the Old Testament, remember the New Testament this time was being written by people like Peter and Paul and John. What they had available to them was the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is still all about Jesus. Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Remember, Jesus means God saves. Christ means the Anointed One. And Lord means He is our Messiah or our Master who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of Holiness. That is the theological term of the hypostatic union. Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. He was as much God as He'd never been man, and as much man as He'd never been God. You say, Pastor, that sounds supernatural. I say, yes, it is. Jesus was the God-man. By the resurrection from the dead, remember that resurrection is the linchpin, it is the litmus test, it is the deciding factor that sets aside Christianity from all other world religions or philosophies. We worship a Savior who is not in a dead and a grave. We do not worship a philosophy that is dry and old. We worship and serve a living and an alive Lord. Through Him we have received grace and apostleship. That means we are saved by grace and then we are sent by God. Apostle means a sent one. There are no longer apostles, capital A, as the position, but we all are apostles, lowercase a, carrying the gospel to our family, our friends, and our neighbors, those closest to us, but furthest from God. Every Christian is a missionary and everyone who is not a believer in Christ is our mission field. <clears throat> for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. If you remember, I reminded us that you are called by God you are called for salvation. You are called for sanctification. You are called for stewardship. You are called for service. Not just the pastors that we recognized are called. We are all called by God to serve Him with the gifts and the experiences and the resources that He has granted to us. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Remember, there's only two categories of people in all the world. Saints and ain'ts. You're either a believer in Jesus Christ or you are not. We in this world use a lot of things to divide ourselves up to be able to have different categories of people. But in God's economy, there's only saints and ain'ts. You're, it's not white or black. It is not rich or poor. It's not smart or dumb. It is either you know Jesus Christ or you do not know Him. The Bible says that is goats and the sheep. That says the Bible is the, the wheat and the tares. There's two categories of people in God's sight. And you cannot almost be a saint. You're either a saint or you're not. That you either know Jesus Christ or you do not know Jesus Christ. And you need to make that decision now if you have not already made that thus far. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The order is important. You cannot have the peace of God and the peace with God until you first experience the grace of God. Amen? And as you first know Jesus as your Savior, and you're living for Him as your Lord, your life will not be rightly aligned. We want to find peace. 
We want to find that in all different areas. But unless you're right with the Holy God, unless you know Him and you're known by Him, you will not have peace in life. You're not exempt from the same heartaches that anyone who doesn't know God has. You are going to have a, a relational challenges. You are going to have health issues. You are going to have work issues. You're going to have the same problems in life, but you can face them differently because you know the grace of God. You know that God will not fail. And you know that God is working all things together for His good for those of us who love Him. Amen? First, Paul says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. The church of Rome, the Christians in Rome, they had a testimony. They were known for something. They had a testimony because they faced adversity. This wasn't an easy time in Rome to be a Christian. And we talked about as Christians today, you cannot have a testimony without going through the tests and the motives. That you have to go through the challenges of life so that people can see the good and the glory of God in you. Don't look at the challenges as something that is surprising. Look at the challenges of life as part of the human experience and an opportunity for you to now give glory to God and see what God has next for you. Amen? God is in the business of closing doors and opening others. It's not our job to spend time kicking on the doors that He's closed. It's our job to find the doors that are open and move through those with a positive attitude and giving glory to God, allowing the Universities to build our faith and to give us a stronger testimony. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, and without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Christians, I want you to know that your prayer life reveals your spiritual condition or your lack thereof. Know that Christians are prayer warriors. That Christians recognize our dependence upon God. Paul was a soul winner and a prayer warrior. Now we're not going to be the Apostle Paul, but we too can be soul winners and prayer warriors. That is not an extra level of Christianity. That's simply biblical Christianity. It's what God's called us all to be. To share our faith and to talk to God consistently is part of the Christian life experience. Making request, if by some means now at last I may, be I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. Paul wanted to come and use his gift of teaching and leadership to develop those Christians to form a church with a unified purpose of understanding the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, and eventually supporting Paul in his missions endeavor to go not just to Rome, but through Rome to Spain. Friends, I want you to know that's why we exist as the church of Jesus Christ is to have an evangelism mindset. Amen? Church is not just about fixing our lives and helping us recover from addictions and mending our marriages. Those are good things and they often happen as byproducts, but the purpose for us to come together is to know God and to make Him known. That was Paul's desire for the church in Rome. He did not say, I'm going to come to do a marriage conference, so those, those are good. He didn't say, I'm going to come and, and develop a recovery ministry, though those are good. He didn't say, I'm going to come and put together a trail life program, that those are good, and we ought to do those things. But the ultimate purpose for all those things is to bring people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and then equip them to be able to take that message to others. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. And Paul said, I'm coming to you. I'm your spiritual father. I'm going to come with you to my gifts, but I'm also going to receive from you. Paul understood the need for Christian community. 
Paul knows what we know that God uses three things to grow us. The Spirit of God, the Word of God, and the people of God. If you try to live the Christian life alone, you're going to make yourself spiritual roadkill. You've got to be in the family of God because you are created by Christ for community. Now, I do not uh, want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among other Gentiles. So we learned that Paul had prayed and he desired to go to Rome, but something outside of his control prevented him from making that trek up until writing this letter. He wanted to now go back to Jerusalem and after that he planned to go to Rome. That works out not in the way that he anticipated. He doesn't get to Rome as a preacher, but as a prisoner. But even as a prisoner, he makes himself a preacher. Amen? He did not allow the circumstances to to stop him. He allowed the circumstances to propel him. And we surmise that while he was a prisoner in Rome, they would attach soldiers to him probably from the emperor's main inner circle of soldiers, the Praetorian Guard. And many of those came to faith in Christ and were influencers in that society. Amen? Amen. But Paul wanted to get there, but something had stopped him. Ministry obligations health issues maybe it was god who led him elsewise or maybe it was the devil himself we know the devil hates the work of god whenever god is working the devil's going to try to counteract that amen don't be surprised by it if you're doing a good work for god the devil's going to try to mess something up he's going to get his tentacles inside your marriage He's going to try to interrupt your health issues. He's going to try to break something down. He's going to try to discourage you. Hey, that's part of the commitment to Christ. Amen. Whenever you're walking with God, your target gets bigger on your back. And the devil wants to get you to stumble. wants to get you to fall. He wants you to get you distracted because the last thing he wants to do is to see used by God for the purposes of God. This takes us to verses 14 through 17, our verses for today. Listen closely. I am a debtor. Say debtor. 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 Both to Greeks and to barbarians. Both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Most commentators agree that these two verses, 16 and 17, are probably the most important two verses in this amazing book in the Bible. They really kind of give us in a nutshell uh, a summary of what the rest of this book is going to be worked out by the great Apostle Paul. These two verses deserve our best attention, our deepest contemplation, and our most authentic application in our lives. But I'm going to get us a running start to that beginning in verse 14. So Paul says some things about himself here, some I am statements that I think that we can apply to ourselves today. In your outline inside your worship bulletin, number one, I am obligated verse 14 says I am a debtor Paul says I'm obligated I'm under a debt that I'm compelled to repay now you may say pastor how can Paul be in a debt for a free gift 
When you read this at first, and I probably thought about it myself at first, Paul's saying, well, because Jesus saved me, I now have a debt to serve God in return to pay Him back for what He's done for me. Now, friends, I do agree that your life is a thank you letter back to God. Amen? That your physical life and your spiritual life are gifts from God to us. And what we do with them is our gift back to God. Amen? We don't want to waste our physical lives. And we don't want to waste our spiritual lives. We don't want to just spend our lives. We want to invest our lives. We want to be able to stand before God one day and hear Him say to us, Well done, my good and faithful servant. We want to run the race that God has for us. We want to do what God's called us to do. We want to be found faithful in God's sight. Amen? But Paul's not talking about paying back his salvation. Friends, you can never pay back your salvation. You cannot do anything to earn your salvation. There's nothing you can do to pay God back for your salvation. It is a price beyond your capacity to pay. Our salvation is not a paycheck to earn, but a gift to receive. It is by God's grace alone and our faith that receives it that we receive our salvation. It's not by our works. The Bible has many verses that pack that up. So what is Paul talking about? It says he's a debtor. Well, think about this, church. There's two ways that you can be a debtor. If somebody gave you a $100 bill, you took that $100 bill and you put it in your pocket, but the person who gave it to you said, I need that back eventually. You have a debt to that person. There's going to be some time in the future where you take that Benjamin out and give it back to the person who gave it to you, right? That's right. That is not what Paul is talking about. That is not the way salvation works. God doesn't say, I'm going to subtract your sin and add my righteousness in your life, but one day you're going to pay me back for that. That's not the way salvation works. But here's the second way debt can occur. If someone gave you a $100 bill, you put it in your pocket, and the lender said, you don't have to give that money back to me, but here's what I want you to do with it. I need you to give it to somebody else in need. Now you are no longer a debtor to the one who gave it to you, but you're a debtor to others to have your eyes wide open to see who has the need so you can use that gift that was given to you to go through you to someone else. Amen? That's how salvation works. You were given salvation by God not to hold it to yourself, but now to pass it along to others. And I can assure you there are more than just one person that needs that gift. And the gift you have is worth so much more than a $100 bill. You got the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ that God calls you to give away and you are a debtor to that. If you do not give it away, you've hoarded it to yourself. And friends, that is a sin in the sight of God. We also learn here, not only does Paul say he's a debtor, but he's a debtor to both Greeks and barbarians. In that day and time, those two phrases would have had very clear understandings. Greek were the highly intellectual, the sophisticated of the day, those who were in the, the haves, and the barbarians were in the have-nots. Barbarian is not even really a word. It is a sound that was turned into a word. They would say these barbarians, the ones who are not educated, the way they talk makes such little sense. It's like you're saying bar, 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 bar. And it turned into barbarians. You know that? There's a highly intellectual and the not so much. It's those who had and those who had not. Paul is saying, I'm a debtor that I need to take this gospel to the up and out and the down and out. He said that God can save the guttermost to the uttermost. That He can save those who are on the top rung and those who are on the bottom rung of the social ladder. That's one thing I love about our church, that there's a diversity in our congregation. Amen? We love that because we believe the gospel causes us all to have a level footing at the base of the cross. Amen? 
That, that's the way the kingdom of God is supposed to be. And that's certainly the way that heaven is supposed to be. And Paul understood this context well. He understood that God can save the most or the least. He knew that God came to save those the world says has it all. And those to whom the world says they have nothing. He said this in 1 Timothy 1, 12-15. Paul says this, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because He counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus, verse 15. Listen to these words. Here's how Paul self-describes himself. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul knew that the gospel can save anyone. Even one who was full of pride, was full of envy, was full of murder, that was full of malice. Paul in the world was highly educated, as there are many today. There's never been more resources of higher education to have knowledge of the world, but to have spiritual blindness. To not have true wisdom because wisdom begins with the fear of God. We have today, you can watch any pundit on TV. There's highly education with, with colleges from great names that we know about. But they are blind to the spiritual truths of God and God's word. And it's saying that gospel brings us all to equal footing. And Paul said, I am an example of just that. So Paul said, I'm obligated. Friends, we are obligated as Christians to take the gospel to our family and friends. Amen? You, you are not obligated to be Billy Graham. You're not obligated uh, to be able to be a worldwide author. You're not obligated to be the Apostle Paul. But you are obligated in your sphere of influence to be a witness for God. Do you feel that obligation? Do you feel that you've been given a gift from God that you cannot hoard for yourself? You're not to be a stagnant pond, but you're to be a flowing stream with the living Word of God. Number two, Paul says, I am eager. I am eager, not just obligated, but in verse 15 it says, I am eager. It says this in verse 15, so... As much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. He's ready to preach the gospel. Right? It's about a man who worked in a factory, and he was always the first one out the door. When the five o'clock bell rang, he was the first one out the door every single day. Well, finally, one of his co-workers said, Hey, Cletus. How are you the first one out the door every day? And Cletus says, you see, I stays ready, so I don't have to get ready. Amen. We need to stay ready so we don't have to get ready. Amen. Paul says, I am eager. I am ready. I'm not waiting for God to try to convince me to share the gospel. I am eager to do so. The Greek word for eager is what we get a picture of a runner leaning forward in a race. You ever ran track or cross country in your younger years? You wanted to lean forward to get the best start you could have. Amen? And at the finish line, you want to lean forward so you cross the tape as quickly as possible. That's the kind of eagerness that we're to live the Christian life and the kind of eagerness that we want to share the gospel with others. It's one thing to have an obligation to pay a debt, but it's something else to be eager to do it. Amen? 
Paul says, I'm obligated to do this thing, but I'm not going to do it begrudgingly. I'm going to do it joyfully. It is God's great privilege in my life to be an ambassador for the Lord. I'm afraid that far too many Christians feel that joy. They know they should share their faith. They know they should live boldly. They know they should be eager to do the things of God. But it's almost like it's a duty instead of a delight. Paul says he was eager to preach the gospel. That means he was willing to use his words. Now friends, our life has to match our words. Our words have no weight. Amen? Your audio and your visual have to match or it counteracts the message. People would rather hear, uh, would rather see a message before they hear a message because seeing the message gives credence to what you say. Amen? But eventually, you have to open your mouth and be able to articulate the gospel. You say, well, pastor, I don't know how to do that. Well, I'm here to tell you some good news. If you are saved, if you're truly saved today, you know everything you need to know to win someone else to Christ. You know that? If you're saved today, that means you've heard the gospel. You've heard that Jesus lived, died, rose again. You've heard that you've got to repent of your sin, put your faith in Jesus Christ. You have heard there's salvation no other way. You've heard there's got to be a commitment. You may say it with your mouth, but it's a commitment in your heart that Jesus is your Savior and your Lord. Not one of many, but the one and only. You know those things, and you're banking on those things. You're committed to those things. That's all you need to know to share with someone else. Amen? If you're saved today, you know all that you need to know to win someone else to Christ. Well, what are you doing with it? Now here at the Mission Church, we teach a simple evangelism uh, tool called Three Circles. Look in your announcements. It's coming up in just a couple of weeks. If you have not had some training in evangelism, come and allow us for two weeks to teach you how to use three circles. A very practical and simple way to turn everyday conversations into gospel <coughs> conversations. You may have heard the statement that sometimes given credit to St. Francis of Assisi. He said this, Preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Here's how it really should be said. Preach the gospel at all times and because it's necessary, use words. Friends, nobody is saved by your good life. Now your bad life can certainly turn people away from God. Amen. Your poor testimony can certainly say a lot about your Jesus and you have a testimony. It's either a good testimony or it's a poor testimony. Your life is either drawing people to God or away from God based upon your life. But eventually, living a good life is not enough for someone else to get saved. You have to be able to open your mouth and share the gospel. Whether it is walking the Romans road, whether it is uh, the faith Bible study uh, principle, whether it is uh, sharing Jesus without fear, whether it is uh, three circles, those are just tools. But you've got to open your mouth and share the gospel. Listen to this. Romans 10, 13-17 says this. Romans 10, 13-17. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love that salvation is simple. Amen? If God had not made it simple, I would have never got it. The Bible simply says, if you call upon the Lord, you shall be saved. I called upon the Lord for my salvation in the fall of 1999. I hope you know, maybe not the exact date and time, but a general time in your life where you called upon the Lord to be saved. How then shall they call upon Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Again, a preacher doesn't mean someone who's ordained and stands in a pulpit. Every Christian is to be a preacher, or you could say a proclaimer, or an evangelist, or a witness. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? And friends, I want you to know, you are sent. It's called the Great Commission. Amen? It's on our wall right there. Understand, you are sent 
by God to share the gospel. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. This is my only hope for beautiful feet. If you see my feet right now physically, they are not beautiful. And Becky said, Amen. But why can have beautiful feet spiritually if you share the gospel? Who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Here he is. So then by faith. So then faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. You are saved because somebody spoke the gospel to you. It may have been an individual came to your door and knocked on a good uh, evangelist. It may have been a preacher. It may have been a podcast. It may have been a revival service. It may have been a track that you read. But guess what? Someone had to write those words. Amen? Even if you get saved reading the Bible, guess what? God used some human authors inspired by the Holy Spirit to write John 3.16, to write Romans 116 to give the gospel you were saved because somebody shared the gospel with you friends I want you to know that uh, I met a friend here recently a re-met a friend and actually uh, he's going to come do a revival our first revival this year amen in November I got a friend of mine Wesley Paul going to come do a revival I shared about some things we're doing here at the church he knows I like my acrostics my axe and my soap and my trust and my bless, all these things. So he gave me a new acrostic, and I'm going to give it to you today. Here's something that you can pray. I want you to pray for Bob. B-O-B. Pray for Bob. Here's what it means, Brother Jim. First B stands for a burden. Second O is for opportunity. The third letter B is for boldness. Hey, pray for burden opportunity and boldness you pray those prayers and God will give you a burden to reach the lost you pray that God will give you supernatural appointments to talk with those who are in need one of my prayers is that God you'll place me in contact with those who are receptive to the gospel and ready and help me to share the gospel in a clear and a compelling way that's one of the prayers that I make consistent in my life. And then boldness. That you would have the boldness to open your mouth, to risk the fear, to risk the uncertainty, to be able to not allow the fear of man to trump the fear of God, that you'll care enough for your family and friends to tell them the truth about a life and eternity. Number three, I am unashamed. Verse 16, I am unashamed. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul was not ashamed. He was proud of the gospel. Now Jesus said something about this. In Mark 8, 38, Jesus said, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words... In his adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Jesus said, if you are ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. Now that should scare the spit out of you. That should scare the sin out of you. That should scare the stupid out of you. Amen. We don't want to be ashamed of God. He's not ashamed of us. Amen? Jesus is not just an amendment to our lives. He becomes the center and the circumference of all that we are. Paul being exempt. Now why did he say, I'm not ashamed? Why did he have to point that out? Well, in my sanctified imagination, I believe people were accusing Paul of being ashamed. I think why some people were saying Paul hasn't come to Rome because he's afraid to come to the big city. Sure, he goes to some of these outposts. He goes to the churches in Galatia. He's been to Corinth. Yeah, sure, he has a ministry in Antioch. But that message he has, that'll never fly here in the big city. He, he's ashamed to bring that simple gospel message here. And Paul is saying, that's not the case. I am not ashamed. I'm going to get there as soon as I can. Amen? 
Well, why could there be shame about the gospel? The same reasons then are the same reasons today. Number one, there was a moral condition in that day. Nero was the emperor. The city of Rome was a cesspool of sin. And the gospel, when it comes, it demands repentance. It demands holiness. It demands a godly life. Wherever the gospel goes, wherever Jesus goes, there's an expectation to live under the principles and the precepts of God. That was unpopular then, and it's unpopular today. It's easy for us to be ashamed today of God, of God's Word, of the Gospel, because it doesn't mesh with the things that our society says are good, right, and true. The things that society says we should celebrate, the Bible says those are wickedness in God's sight, and it's our responsibility to conform our lives, our churches, and our communities to God's purposes and not our own. It's easy for us to backpedal and easy for us to become ashamed and want to kind of hide our light under a basket whenever it is countercultural. But I want you to know, we can never make a difference unless we are willing to be different. Also in that day, there was a great uh, negative view on the Jewish population. The Romans thought the Jews were kind of like, uh, uh, came from the backside of nowhere. These were religious uh, nutcases. But the Gospel says that Jesus was a Jew. That the first disciples were Jewish. <coughs> Paul was Jewish. That we understand that in the Roman society, they said, that makes no sense. Why would we, who have all this spiritual and all this intellectual power, listen to this simple message from a backwoods kind of people? Does this sound familiar to our day today? People look at Christians and say, well, they're antiquated. They're out of step with time. They need to revise their book. They need to get with the times. They're narrow-minded. The same things that Paul was dealing with. He said, I'm not ashamed. We have to be able to say, I'm not ashamed, even when it's not popular with the family and friends and culture around us. There's also a contempt just for the Gospel itself. The message of the Gospel, the Bible says, is foolishness. To say we are trusting our here and our hereafter, our days and our decades and our eternity to a man named Jesus who never traveled further than about 150 miles from where He was born, who died on a Roman cross, was buried, rose again, living now in heaven, praying for us, promising to come back one day. Those are foolish things to the world. But those are the things that are near and dear to us. And if you are a Christian, you are believing those things, not with just mental assent, but with heart conviction. Times haven't changed that much. The same things that Paul had to face and say, I was unashamed. We have to do the very same thing today. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel. The Gospel of Christ or the Gospel of God, he said earlier. Remember, there is only one Gospel and it's God's Gospel. There are other Gospels that are being proclaimed today that you need to make sure you are aware of and recognize that they are alive from the pit of hell that still smells like smoke. There's a wall of religion. Just try harder, do better, be more disciplined. Those things are good. I'd rather have a positive thinking than negative thinking. Amen? But positive thinking isn't going to save you. Trying harder isn't going to save you. It's sometimes good to do to get off your lazy backside and get active doing something, but that's not what the gospel is about. There's the uh, false gospel of materialism that gain is the goal of life. 
There are even uh, movements in the church where they baptize greed and materialism. That if you just trust Jesus, He'll fill your bank account up. You trust Jesus, He'll give you an airplane. Ask God for your Lincoln uh, Continental, and He's got to give it to you. Friends, that is nothing more than the green-eyed monster of envy and greed baptized with a little veneer of Jesus. Amen? That is not what the Gospel is about. There are many people who know Jesus, love Jesus, serve Jesus, but they are in poverty through circumstances outside of their own. And that doesn't mean they lack faith or lack commitment. It simply means we're not in heaven yet. Amen? Amen. There's also a false gospel of hedonism. If it feels good, do it. You're the bottom line. If you want to do it, it's your body. It's your choices. If it makes you happy, just go do it. You are your own God. Friends, that is not the gospel of God. God wants His kids to be happy, but He knows we will be happy when we do things God's way. Amen? Amen. God is not trying to stop us from having a good time. He's trying to protect us for His glory. Amen? There's also the false gospel of humanism. If it's, a, if it's to be, it's up to me. There's no real God. And some Christians live this way. Kind of like practical atheists. I know that I'm saved through God. But you know what? I'm going to take care of my life from here. Friends, that's not the gospel. That we're saved by God. We're sustained by God. We desperately need God in every moment of our lives. And there's the gospel of liberalism. As long as you believe in something, as long as you're genuine about your beliefs, and it's okay, all roads lead to heaven, right? We cannot take a, a hard stand on anything. Well, friends, there's some things in the Bible that we don't just need to be dogmatic about. We need to be bulldogmatic about it. Amen? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. We're told in Acts that there's never salvation in any other name but the name of Jesus Christ. We didn't make that up. God made that up. So if we try to fudge with the gospel, try to minimize the gospel, it turns to be not the true gospel or the gospel of God and the gospel of Christ. We also learn here that Paul says it's for the Jews and for the Greeks. So first of all, we talked about the Greeks and the barbarians. That was a, a social status. This now is talking about, when it comes to Jews and Greeks, a religious status. The Jews had the whole history of God's revelation. The Greeks had their philosophers of the day. And Paul says, Jesus is the same Lord of both. There's not an exception. There's only one way, the true and living God. Whether you are religious and pious or not, there's only one way, and it's through faith in Jesus Christ. It says that there is faith. You've got to put your belief or your faith in the Lord. That's more than mental assent. It's more than knowing with your head. It's believing with your heart. James 2.19 says that devils believe and they tremble. There's a lot of people who believe with their mind God, but they do not have a relationship with Christ. There's a tremendous difference. There was a tightrope tight rope walker named Charles Blondin who crossed the Niagara Falls in the summer of 1859. Before he crossed the fall in the tight line, the first time he asked the crowd that had gathered to watch his great feet, he said, do you think I can do this? Do you believe I will be successful? And everybody cheered and hooray. We know you can do it. And Blondin, sure enough, he walked across the Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Walked over and walked back. Now he said, do you think I can do it again? But this time, blindfolded. Oh yes, we know you can do it. We believe you can do it. He sure enough put a blindfold on and walked across and walked back. Next time he said, do you believe I can do it now? Blindfolded and pushing a wheelbarrow. Oh yes, you can do it. We know you can do it. We believe in you. Well, I need a volunteer. Huh. Crickets. Crickets. See, that's the difference between <coughs> belief with your head and belief with your heart. Have you ever got in the wheelbarrow? Have you ever got in the wheelbarrow of faith where you say, God, I'm going to do things your way. I'm not going to trust all pop psychology. I'm not going to try to add you to these other Eastern mysticism things I'm going to do. I'm not going to add you to the tarot cards that I play or the Ouija board that I tinker with. 
I'm going to do things your way when it comes to my relationships, when it comes to my money, when it comes to my time, when it comes to my life. I'm going to do things your way. I'm going to be in, all in, trusting you, I believe, not just with my words, but with my actions, that you are able to take me safely across. That's the difference between head knowledge and heart conviction. And so I want you to know that faith in Jesus Christ is not a leap in the dark, but it's a step into the light. Amen? Amen. You're stepping into the truth that's been revealed in Scripture, revealed through all these centuries of the faithfulness of God to do what He said He would do. And a big part of that is saving your soul and preparing you for eternity. Lastly, number four, Paul says, I am confident. Confident. Verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So commentators, theologians, they debate whether this righteousness is speaking about the Christian's righteousness or about God's righteousness. Is God's righteousness being revealed by faith to faith? Or is our righteousness being revealed by faith to faith? I think there can be dual application. First of all, if you are a Christian, you are a saint who is righteous. And there should be a righteousness in you that's developing by faith to faith. That there's a growing progression of your righteousness. That there's a growing commitment to Christ, but there's also the righteousness of God. The goodness of God is being revealed in your life because He has chosen to redeem you and save you and reconcile you and give you meaning and give you purpose. That you are a reflector of the righteousness of God. No verse says it better than this. 2 Corinthians 5.21 for God made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And so I want to ask you a question today. Have you become the righteousness of God? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ with confidence that you are saved and secured in Jesus Christ? He wants you to have a no-so salvation, not just a hope-so salvation. He wants you to be able to know with rock rib conviction that you are saved, you're in the family of God, that you have a purpose in this life, and you have a home prepared for you in heaven. If you do not have that confidence, today is the day that you receive it. Heads bowed.